Hello, friends. Here at 3AB and Sabbath School panel, we're making our way through our study on God's everlasting covenant. In fact, that's exactly what it's called. It's called the promise, God's everlasting covenant. And we're learning that the covenant really is all about our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we want to encourage you to stick it out with us each and every way through because we're learning more and more as we dive deep into God's Word. But we want to tell you how you can get a copy of this lesson if you don't have one already. So you can go online if you don't have a copy. You can get a digital copy at absg.advent. Adventist.org, and you can access a copy for free. But of course, we always encourage you, if you can, uh, find your local Seventh-day Adventist church, and they can provide a copy for you for free as well. And then you get to fellowship and study God's Word with like-minded individuals. So again, grab your pens, your pencils, your writing utensils, iPads, whatever it is you use, and get ready to dive deep with us into God's Word as we discuss God's everlasting covenant. Hello, friends, and welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. Again, we're so blessed that you're joining us each and every week as we are studying through God's Word on God's everlasting covenant. That's our topic, and we're learning so much. And uh, we have lots to cover today as today's lesson is actually entitled An Everlasting Covenant. And we're going to be looking at God's names, the meaning of those names, and how they relate to uh, God in connection with the covenant and His people. And so that being said, I'm going to go ahead and introduce this fine panel. Uh, to my left, I have Miss Jill Morricone. It's always a blessing to have you. Thank you so much, Ryan. Privileged to be here. Amen. Praise the Lord. We have Pastor John Dinsey. How are you, brother? I am doing well, thanks to the Lord, and it's a privilege also for me to be here. Amen. Praise the Lord. And to your left is Miss Shelley Quinn. Always a blessing to hear what you have to say about the covenants. Oh, this is exciting to me. Amen. And of course, last but not least, on the far end of the table, Thursday's lesson today is Pastor John Loma King. Yeah, I'll get whatever you guys leave over for me. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Praise the Lord. Again, we're talking about God's everlasting covenant. And um, I'm going to read the memory text before we pray. And then we're going to pray and get right into this. So I love this. Genesis chapter 17, verse 7 says, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. So, Pastor John Lemekin, on that note, why don't you have a prayer for us? Gracious Father, loving Lord, as we come this morning before the table of grace, Father, we pray that you'll prepare for us a table from which we can partake and know that this bread has been imparted to us to impart to others. Give us wisdom, Lord. Synchronize our hearts and minds. And may your Holy Spirit pour through the funnel of our obedient hearts that those who are listening and those who are watching may find the strength that they are in need of to walk in harmony with this covenant. Bless the production aspects of it. And may all the glory and honor go to you alone. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. You know, growing up in the day family household when I was a kid, uh, my, my family, my parents taught us that your word means something. Honor your word. Honor your agreements that you make with someone. If you make a promise, then you honor that promise. And as I'm reading that text that we just read from Genesis 17, 7, as God says, you know, to you and your descendants and to you in their generation for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. I love that, the fact that we, we say that a lot. It kind of rolls off the tongue easy, everlasting covenant. But when you really focus in on what that's saying, it's beautiful to consider that we serve an everlasting God, that he's saying, you know what, through thick and thin, whatever it is that we're going through, I'm there for you. I am your God. And 
I'm going to honor my word. I'm going to keep my word because that's who I am. I'm an everlasting God and my covenant is not something that just goes and stops, right? Or comes to a certain point and it just becomes null and void. It is something that will last in as much as you stay with me and you are committed to me. I love the fact that we serve an almighty loving God that is everlasting and his word never fails. I want to start with Sabbath afternoon's lesson. There was a, there was a beautiful little uh, couple of paragraphs here that really, I think, warms us up and sets us up for the study of this week. And I'm going to read that now. It says, how many remember distinctly in your childhood a sickness or a touch of pneumonia, perhaps, that made us very sick with the potential for some, something even worse? In the long feverish night, we would awaken from a half sleep to see our mother or father sitting in a chair beside our bed in the soft glow of the nightlight. Just so, in a figurative human sense, God sat by the bedside of a sin-sick world as moral darkness began to deepen in the centuries after the flood. For this reason, he called out Abraham and planned to establish through his faithful servant a people to whom he could entrust a knowledge of himself and give salvation. Therefore, God entered into a covenant with Abraham and his posterity that emphasized in more detail the divine plan to save humankind from the results of sin. The Lord was not going to leave his world unattended, not with it in such dire need. I, was, I like the way that set that up because it sets us up for Sunday's lesson, which dives deep into the meaning and the emphasis and, and importance of the name of God and how he uh, introduced himself to Abraham. And uh, I want to go ahead and go to Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. This is where God introduces the covenant uh, to Abraham and introduces himself. And basically, he shows up and says, this is me. This is what I'm all about. This is who I am. Uh, and I want you to know exactly who it is that is seeking after you, Abraham, and that's calling upon you. So this is Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Notice what the Bible says. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to them, you shall, uh, you, so shall your descendants be. And he believed, I love this. This is uh, Genesis 15, verse 6. He says, and he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. But our key verse is the next verse, verse 7. It says, then he, then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. So God basically identifies himself here. I am am the Lord your God. And of course, the lesson brings out that names, of course, can sometimes be like trademarks, right? They're often associated with certain traits and characteristics. For instance, if I say certain names like, I don't know, Albert Einstein, right? There's something that comes to our mind. We have certain qualities, certain traits and characteristics. Another person, Martin Luther King Jr. Absolutely. Hitler. Okay, something comes to the mind, right? Harriet Tubman. These are all famous historical names. Abraham Lincoln, right? Something comes to your mind. Michael Jordan. <laughs> and then one more, Ellen G. White. Every one of these historical individuals, when you say their name, it's not just a name. There are certain, uh, these, these, are, these names are associated with certain characteristics, traits, and ideals that immediately come to your mind when you hear that. So during Bible times, obviously people of the Near, uh, of the near East or the Middle East attached great importance to the meaning of names. In fact, the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, has this to say. This is Volume 1, page 523 of the SDA Bible Commentary. It says, the Hebrews always thought of a name as indicating either the personal characteristics of the one named or the thoughts and emotions of the one giving the name. 
or attendant circumstances at the time the name was given. And so I think of certain names in Bible, like, you know, that famous one, when you think of Jacob, right? What was Jacob's name associated with? Deceiver, supplanter, right? So that was a horrible name to be given, but that's what he was known before God changed his name. I think of Michael, right? Michael is the one who is like God. These names mean something. Well, the same thing here is what the Sunday's lesson is bringing about, that when God introduced himself, even though it says in our English Bible, for instance, you may have a King James or a New King James Bible, and there, and the, if you have a King James Bible, it's going to be all caps, L-O-R-D, the, I am the Lord your God, right? Uh, but in the original language, they're bringing out that actually God's name, He identifies Himself, He actually gives a name, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur. So He identified Himself, and of course, with that name comes a meaning, with that name comes an identifying factor or characteristics or ideals or, or, or certain traits that come along with that. And uh, it's interesting that that name, Yahweh, which we see in our Bible as Lord, uh, it's, it appears more than 6,828 times in the Old Testament alone, which is powerful. God wants us to know who He is. He wants us to know that I am the Lord, your God. It also happens to be a name, of course, shrouded in mystery. Uh, scholars suggest it could be a form of the Hebrew verb. I'm hoping I'm saying this correctly, Haya. It almost makes me want to, I don't know, it just comes to Haya, right? You know, you just want to do uh, some, some karate there. But no, seriously, it's, it's a real Hebrew word, and this is what the scholars say, that it comes from the Hebrew verb Haya, which means to be, in which case it also can mean, get this, the eternal one, the existent one, the self-existent one, the self-sufficient one, or the one who lives eternally. Kind of like that everlasting covenant, that eternal covenant. He is an eternal God. He is an eternally existent God. And of course, uh, this is describing the divine attributes of God. It's describing His character. God is revealing to Abraham, and, it, and it's powerful if you think about this. Abraham was in Ur. Of course, this is a region outside of Babylon. So he would have been just, just shrouded and just stooped in and, and Babylonian culture. So you're talking about he's living in the epicenter of occultic practices and pagan polytheistic culture where at every little turn somebody's worshiping some kind of God, whether it's you know the God of the wind or the God of the air or the God of the grass or the God of the sea or the God of gold and silver or whatever kind of gods they serve there. And then this God shows up and says, Hey, Abraham, I'm Yahweh. I'm the eternal one. I'm the self-existent one. And I'm calling you out. I want you to be my man. I've got so many blessings for you. I'm not like all these other false gods. And so this got Abraham's attention. You could imagine it shook his world, right? Because looking at all of these other false gods, what have they done for anyone? He's seeing, he's observing, and he's seeing all these other gods that they're serving here in Babylonian culture. They haven't done anything. But here's a God that says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to make things happen for you. I'm going to bless you. You're going to be a blessing to others. And this is who I am. I am Yahweh. I am the the God of everything. And so Abraham, the Bible says, he believed it and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He knew that there was something different about this God. In fact, in Exodus 3.14, that's what comes to my mind, when God actually identified himself and what this Yahweh means, when he identified himself to Moses and said, you know, when Moses asked him, so what, when I go into Egypt, what should I call you? Who, who should I tell sent me? He said, I am who I am. That's just who you tell me. Why? Because it means I rule over the past, present, and future. I am the only true God. That's who you tell is sent you, the only true God. So God wants Abraham to know his name, right? Because that name reveals aspect of his, aspects of his identity, his personal nature, and his character. And from this knowledge, we can learn to trust in his promises. I'm, I'm thinking of Psalm 9, verse 10, as, I'm, as we're doing this study here. And those who know your name, this is Psalm 9, verse 10, and those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Did God forsake Abraham? Abraham found that out, that God was not bluffing. He wasn't just another false god like all the other false deities that they served in Babylon. He saw this personal God for who he was, the mighty everlasting God. Another one, Psalm 91, verse 14. Love this text. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. God's name is much more than just a name, my friends. 
God's name tells us the story of who He is. He is the Almighty God. He is the everlasting God who wants to bestow that everlasting covenant upon us. If only we would just surrender to Him now and, and accept Him for who He truly is, Yahweh, the eternally existent one. Amen. Mm. Amen. Thank you so Amen. much, Ryan. We're having church. That's yeah, powerful. That's the truth. I think maybe we could have you be just a little less excited. No, I love that. I love Ryan's energy Amen. and enthusiasm. What an incredible setup to our lesson, Yahweh. I love that. I have another of the names of God. I have El Shaddai. Now, El just means God. Mm -hmm. In the Semites, it was their basic name for referring to God. Mm -hmm. And it means might or power. And it occurs many hundred times throughout Hebrew. But it's connected El Shaddai, God with Shaddai. And we're going to study what that means. Let's look first at the first time that this word for God, El Shaddai, is used in the Bible. This is Genesis 17, verse 1. This is talking to Abraham. Genesis 17, verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord, this is Yahweh that Ryan already addressed, mm -hmm. appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Mm -hmm. I am El Shaddai. Mm -hmm. Walk before me and be blameless. This covenant making story is introduced by this appearance of God right here. And God repeats his promise to Abram. Remember his promise first made in Genesis 12. It was repeated in Genesis chapter 15, that promise of descendants, but yet he's still childless. That promise of land, and yet he doesn't have a great deal. That reaffirmation, God reaffirmed his covenant right here with Abram to both him and his descendants. And he gave circumcision as a sign of that covenant. Now, Abram was 75 years old, which we would consider in today's society, he's already getting older, maybe even retirement age. And yet at, at the age 75, he is called to leave Ur of the Chaldeans. And at this point, He's 99 years old, and that promise that God gave to him, he hasn't seen the fulfillment yet. Mm -hmm. So God comes and says, I am the Almighty One. I can fulfill that promise. Shaddai occurs 48 times, the word Shaddai, in Hebrew, almost exclusively in the book of Genesis and the book of Job. Of course, the first time it occurs, we just read that reference there. And Shaddai comes, now we translate it, we, you could say sanitize it in English, in the Bible, because we translate it God Almighty. And clearly, God is Almighty. But the original word Shaddai comes from Shad, which literally means breast. So you could say this means the mighty breast. This is where we get that concept of God Almighty. Remember, maybe two weeks ago, I'm trying to remember when it was, a couple weeks ago, Pastor John, I think it was Pastor John, talked about we are made in the image of yes. God. Male and female created in the image of God, meaning that God has, you could say, attributes, characteristics that would be both what we would naturally identify as masculine or feminine. And in this case, the mightiness of God implies power, but not power of violence. This is the power of bountifulness. It suggests that God is the pourer forth, mm -hmm. the shedder of blessings. He is our El Shaddai, in contrast with the weakness and the frailty of humanity. So let's look at, you might say, okay, so why do I care about that? What does it matter to know that God is our El Shaddai? I think there's seven lessons, seven reasons that I can see here. You know, I was going there, Ryan. So lesson number one, El Shaddai gives me hope in seemingly impossible situations. That's what God did to Abram. He's 99 years old and he was given the promise years before. And yet he and his wife are way past the childbearing age, especially his wife past the time of woman. There's no way from a human perspective that they could have children. And yet God appears and he says, I am a powerful God. I am a bountiful God. I am the God who can pour forth and shed blessings upon you, whatever you need. Whatever you lack, I will supply it. 
So are you facing a seemingly impossible situation today? Know that your God, El Shaddai, he specializes, God Almighty, in taking a seemingly impossible situation and turning it around. The second lesson I see is that El Shaddai can adjust how others view us. Now, this is an interesting one. This is in Genesis chapter 43. Jump over to Genesis chapter 43. And we see the reference to El Shaddai again. Genesis 43, verse 14. Now, to set up this story, we see that Israel, or this was Jacob, but of course his name was changed later to Israel. Um, he believes his son Joseph is dead although he was really sold into slavery mm -hmm. in Egypt, and now he's the prime minister. But Jacob doesn't know all that, so he believes Joseph is dead. There's a famine in the land, and the people are starving. His family is starving. He sent them to Egypt for food. This t harsh taskmaster, who turns out to be Joseph, kept Simeon in prison there. The family comes back to daddy, and then he says, Oh, but you need to go for food again. And they said, we can't go because the overseer said, we got to bring our little brother Benjamin with us this time. And so this is where El Shaddai comes in. We're in Genesis 43, verse 14. And may God Almighty, that's El Shaddai, give you mercy before the man that he may release your older brother and Benjamin. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. He's praying, God Almighty, El Shaddai, to change how this overseer looks at the situation, to give him mercy in his heart. Lesson number three, El Shaddai pours out blessings into our lives. We see this in, jump over a couple more chapters, I, Genesis 49, verse 25. This is Israel's final blessing at the end of his life to his sons. And this is the blessing to Joseph in particular. By the God, that's El, of your father who will help you. And by the Almighty, that's Shaddai, who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lie beneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb. El Shaddai pours out blessings into your life. Are you walking in a place that's seemingly impossible? Do you need the people around you to have an attitude adjustment or an eye adjustment with how they're viewing that situation? Do you need blessings poured out into your life? Call on God as your El Shaddai. Number four, El Shaddai is able to correct us. This is a very interesting one to me. Jump over to Job. Job chapter five, verse 17. Behold, happy is the man whom God, that's El, corrects. Mm. Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty, mm. that is Shaddai. Mm. Now, both parents correct, clearly. When you grow up, usually the father disciplines and the mother disciplines. But if we look at the connotations from this, to me, this is specifically looking at how would your mama correct you? And I remember when I was growing up, my mom had many ways to correct me. But the one way that was most effective, I remember she walked into the bedroom. I knew I was going to get whipped. And she walked in and she knelt down. I'll never forget this. And she began to pray. And she said, God, forgive me for not being the mother to Jill that I should mm. have been. And that broke my heart, that mother's love for me, that desire that I would turn from my wicked ways and I would follow God. That brought me, wooed me back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Next lesson is El Shaddai is all powerful. Still in Job, Job 11, verse 7. Can you search out the deep things of God? That's El. Can you find out the limits of the Almighty, the Shaddai? There is no limit to the power of our God. The next lesson, lesson number six, El Shaddai sustains us. Job 33, verse four. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty, or Shaddai, gives me life. So God not only created us in the beginning, but through the power of El Shaddai, we are sustained. And finally, number seven, El Shaddai 
always does the right thing. Mm -hmm. Job 34, verse 12. Surely God, that is El, will never do wickedly, nor will the Almighty, that is Shaddai, pervert justice. El Shaddai is not swayed by other people's opinions, by other people's emotions, or outside pressure. God will always do the right thing. I'm so thankful no matter what we are facing that we can call on him as our El Shaddai. Mm, praise the Lord. I like that. I love that story about your mom. Mama Day, she was a little bit different. She said, Lord, please let this whipping straighten my son out. That's just how, how things were around my house. And many times it did. So <laughs> praise the Lord. Uh, we're going to take a short break. We'll come right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to send it over to Pastor John Denzi for Tuesday's lesson. All right. Now, now we move over to Tuesday's lesson. And the title for today's lesson is From Abram to Abraham. And so this begins with Genesis chapter 17. We're going to read that again in verses 1 through 5. Let's go. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am... Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations." So remember, Abraham, or at this point now, he's 99 years old, no children. And now when he presents himself to people, I heard a pastor say this one. I said, that's very interesting. They say, what is your name? My name is Abraham. And they hear, oh, you're a father of many nations. How many children do you have? <laughs> well, his answer would at that point be, well, I, I have one. You know, but later, of course, the, well, the promise of the Lord became true. He was a father of many nations, and in him all the families of the earth have been blessed. By the way, Abraham lived to 175 years old, blessed of the Lord. Now, when you go to the scriptures, you will notice that many of the names of the people, uh, this is a, a common practice among the Semitic tribes of, of ancient times, the names were heavy laden with spiritual significance. Uh, you see even uh, Adam and Eve when after Cain killed Abel and Seth was born, Eve said this in Genesis chapter 3, verse 25, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son, named, named him Seth, for God has appointed another seed for me instead of, a, instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. Seth means substituted. And that was a blessing from the Lord because they were comforted by the Lord giving, him, giving them another son. Seth. Now, it is interesting that the lesson brings out uh, some examples of name change. Uh, you have Jacob, Jacob's name being changed, Joseph's name being changed by the Egyptians, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, their names were changed. Uh, I'm, if time permits, I will mention another one. But I want to start with the number three example in the lesson. Let's go to Daniel chapter 1, and I'm going to read verse 6 and 7. Notice what happens because the people of Israel were taken captive to Babylon. And some of the princes were taken into the court to be a part of the uh, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, uh, people. And this was a strategic move by Nebuchadnezzar because these princes of the people would help them be able to control the Jews that were captive among them. Now notice what happens, Daniel 1, verse 6. Now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, 
To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Uh, of course, you notice that their names were changed. And it's interesting because these Hebrews, their names meant something special. They had a spiritual significance. The changing of the names was not for a good reason. Uh, it was to, in their, in their lives experience in Babylon, so that they could identify with the gods of, of Babylon. Actually, even the name Babylon in the Babylonian language means gate of the gods. So many gods, they were pagans. And they wanted these Jews not to have their names having uh, beautiful significance about the Almighty God continually sounding. When you call Daniel, let's look at the name significance of Daniel and his friends. Daniel's name uh, means a God of judgment or God is my judge. Hananiah signified the Lord of grace or the Lord is gracious to me. Michael or Mishael conveyed the sense that the, 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 the Lord is the strength, my strength. Uh, Azariah, it's a compound of Azar and Yah, implied the Lord is my help. So their names being changed was to uh, lead them to forget who they were. And so this, of course, uh, had they not stayed close to the Lord, that would have happened. But they chose to be faithful, and, and these guys endured some terrible things. I don't know how many of us... Uh, after the statue was put up and the instruments sounded, would have bowed uh, before that statue that Nebuchadnezzar set up. But you have the three Hebrew worthies being faithful to God until the end. Even after Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, we're going to give you guys a second chance. We're going to see if you're going to bow down. And if you don't, you're going into the fiery furnace. They said, the Lord will deliver us. And if he does not, we are not going to bow down. So there they stay, they remain faithful to God. You know, it's, it's very important to, to recognize that your name means something connected to the Lord. And so uh, I have good news for you and continue to listen and we'll see that in a moment. See, as Christians, we must not, never forget, not forget that we are pilgrims and strangers in this world. I want to talk to you about Jacob because uh, his name uh, was changed for a good reason. Uh, in Genesis chapter 32, verse 28, uh, it says here, And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Uh, and so here you have uh, Jacob's name being cha changed. He wrestled with the angel uh, during the whole night, and uh, he realized that, wait a minute, this is no common man. And so he held on. He held on, and he was uh, blessed to have his name changed. And I want to uh, point out something interesting because uh, his brother said something interesting about him in Genesis 27, verse 34 to 36. When Esau heard the words of his father, see, Jacob had come in and stole the, the blessing that he, that he was supposed to receive. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, bless me also, O my father. But he said, your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright and now look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved the blessing for me? He was desirous to have the blessing that he despised earlier in his life. But Jacob's name was changed to Israel. A wonderful change. And so I'm going to read to you from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 198. Notice here. The error that had led Jacob's sin in obtaining the birthright by fraud was now clearly set before him. He had not trusted God's promises, but had sought by his own efforts to bring about that which God would have accomplished in his own time and way. As an evidence that he had been forgiven, his name was changed from one that was a reminder of his sin to one that commemorated his victory. Thy name, said the angel, shall be called no more Jacob, the supplanter. But Israel, for as a prince, hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. 
Jacob had received the blessing for which his soul had longed. His sin as a supplanter and deceiver had been pardoned. The crisis in his life was past. Doubt and perplexity had, re uh, had and perplexity and remorse had embittered his existence. But now all was changed and sweet was the peace of reconciliation with God. Jacob no longer feared to meet his brother. God, who had forgiven his sin, could move the heart of Esau also to accept his humiliation and repentance. Praise the Lord. His name was changed from something negative to something positive. And the good news I have for you, I don't know what kind of name you have, whether you like it or not. And uh, I, I heard some horrible name that some father gave to his daughters. Uh, they had three daughters. They call them yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I don't know what in the world got into the minds of these parents, but I don't know if you've been called something else uh, that you didn't like by your peers, but God is going to give us a new name bought, bought, bought by us through Jesus Christ. He paid the price to be able to not only redeem us, to call us, call us his children and give us an inheritance, but to have our names changed because God loves us, wants the best for us, Abraham's name was changed so that he could identify with the promises that God had made to him. Amen and amen. Thank you. This has been such a lovely study. Wednesday's lesson is covenant stages. We've already mentioned how God's covenant is an everlasting covenant, one that was made before eternity began, the covenant of redemption. And God is constantly, progressively unfolding this, but even within the covenant of Abraham, he does. So the first, there's three progressive stages as God will see that he approaches Abraham each time he gives him a command and a promise. So let's look at the first stage, Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in all the families of the earth, you in all of the families of the earth will be blessed through you. And then in verse 7, he says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land. And I will, I will, I will. This is God's covenant. Abraham's 75 years old, living in Ur, a pagan society reared by pagan parents. And we know that because in Joshua 24, 2, it says, Terah, that's his father, had served false gods. Yeah. So here is Abram. God's calling him into a new relationship with him. And he says, leave everything familiar behind you. He's living in a town that's a seaport. God's calling him to transition to living the life of a nomad. Whew, this is an incredible incredible example of faith. And 25 years later, he's finally given the son. So God approaches Abraham to be the first special covenant bearer, if you will, the, the one who is going to be the first major figure of the God's covenant of grace. And he does ask, he gives him a command, and it's one that involves total trust in God. I don't know that I'd be that brave. But Hebrews 11 says it was by faith Abraham went out, not knowing where he was going. But the promise was not only, even though it was specifically made to Abraham, it was ultimately a promise that includes all of the whole human race. We see in Galatians 3, Paul's writing about this, verses 6 to 9. Abraham believed God. It was accounted to him for righteousness. Somebody asked me once, do you believe in righteousness by faith? Let me tell you, there is no righteousness except by faith. Righteousness by faith is the only thing that there is with God. And he says, therefore, know that only those who are of faith, this is Paul writing in Galatians 3, only those who who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith 
preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So Paul concludes Galatians 3, 9. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Woohoo! That's the first stage. Now this is the exciting part. God comes back on the second stage. Again, there's an approach, command, and a promise. Genesis 15, 5 through 18. God comes to him. He brings Abraham outside. He says, look now toward the heaven. Count the stars if you're able to number them. So shall your descendants be. And it says in verse 6, he believed in the Lord. And he, God, accounted it to him as righteousness. The covenant, the everlasting covenant has always been righteousness by faith, justified by faith. So then he says in verse 7, God says to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of her and out of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit. So he promises him the land. And you know, then what happens? Abraham makes a genuine request for assurance. He says, Lord, how shall I know I will inherit it? So what God does is he tells him, get a heifer, a goat, and a ram, cut them in half, lay them with a path where there is halves on one side, halves on the other, and a path in between. And then he tells them to get a turtle dove and a pigeon. They, he, they killed, but they're not to be divided. So Abraham obeys. He cuts these animals asunder, lays them this way. Now, you know, in the ancient days when man would cut a covenant with man, make a covenant, they called it cutting a covenant. This is what they did. And, and what would happen is then each man would walk through the path and they are saying basically as they're doing this, taking this covenant, so let it be done to me. Let me be cut in half if I break this covenant. But let's watch this because what happens after Abraham obeys? God puts Abraham in a deep sleep, just like he put when he put Adam in a deep sleep when he was going to create Eve. Now get this. While he's in the deep sleep, God's going to walk through this. Abraham never walks through this because there's only one person making the promises. Abraham did that. There, it didn't involve any promise on Abraham's part. It was God's promises. So God is going to walk through this and he talks to his sleeping prophet, telling him his descendants are going to be, you know, 400 years in this land where they're, they're going to be afflicted and there'll be strangers in the land. And then he promises he'll judge Egypt. So he's talking to Abraham. It's from verses 13 to 21. Abraham's hearing it in a, in a vision as he sleeps. But the Abrahamic covenant, it's interesting to me that God, maybe it's because this is the way people cut covenants. God wanted to prove that it was a covenant, but he was the only one. So figuratively, God is saying, so let it be done to me if I were to break my covenant. Now the third stage, Genesis 17. Whew, Abraham's 99 years old. God appears to him, says, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. Woo! There is, remember, the covenant is God's covenant. He always says, my covenant. He makes the promises. But there are stipulations. There are conditions of obedience. He says, walk before me, be blameless. I'll make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. And Abraham falls on his face. And that's when he says, my covenant is you're going to be the father of many nations. I'm going to change your name from Abram, which means father is exalted to Abraham, which means father of many nations. And then he says, I'm going to make this an everlasting covenant that between me and you, that through you, the world is going to be blessed. Now, let's look in the very short time we've got left. 
Galatians 3, 7. Paul, the New Testament makes it abundantly clear that the true descendants of Abraham are those who have the faith of Abraham, who trust in the promised merit or the merits of the promised Messiah. Galatians 3, 7. Paul says, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Then in verse 29, he says, if you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What is the everlasting covenant? It is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It is God's provision for salvation, for redemption. It was introduced when he said, I'm going to, the woman is going to have a seed. This is why when she's Seth, she thinks he's going to replace the seed. She thinks, hey, Seth is going to be, this is Eve, the, the promised deliverer, the Messiah. But God wants you to know that he is inviting you into covenant. If you're not in covenant with God, you're not saved. How simple can I say that? Oh, thank you, Shelley. Thank you, all of you. I mean, we've been talking about covenants all the way through, and although it's kind of like Daniel in Revelation, we have been repeating and enlarging because Abraham has been mentioned a number of times, and today mine is called covenant obligation. Now, we pointed out the number of covenants we find in Scripture, and just to cap off what we've talked about, I think, since our lesson began, there are about, depending on how you count, if you choose only the Hebrew Bible, you find four uh, major categories that the Jews consider covenants. But when you consider the Bible in its totality, you find the Edenic Covenant, the Noahic Covenant, the Abrahamic Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, which also include a priestly covenant uh, because of the Ark of the Covenant, the services that the priests were to perform, the Davidic Covenant, and then the New Covenant. So you can total it about a seven. But the one thing that unites them all is the God who made the covenants. So when you look at this, you'll find if you put the phrase, the short phrase, I will in the Bible, and I've tried to track this as well as I can, you find more than 2,300 phrases, I will. And when you look at all of them, and I, I tried my best to count as many as I could because, I mean, I couldn't sit there and count all 2,300, but I noticed that all, almost all of those were were the Lord saying, this is what I'm going to do. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Not to include the declarations of a fallen angel, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Those Take those seven out. But in most cases, God was making declarations. And these declarations was from the God of the covenant. Uh, as we talked about the, the tetragrammaton, the, 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 the phonetic name of God, Yahweh, with the just with Y-H-W-H, -H. and he is the God of the covenant. So these covenants were made from beginning to end, and every covenant, and this is something very, import very important to understand, every covenant that God made, he did not have preconditions to him extending the covenant, but he sure did have conditions to those who embraced the covenant. Let's start with Genesis 18, verse 19. And Abraham has been the, Abraham has been the star of, of this panel today. He says, for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. So the Lord made the covenant, but he said, hey, wait a minute, your children, your household, th there's something I'm going to require of them. And then when we find that requirement that the Lord made very clear to Abraham, command your household after the covenant I've made with you. And then you find these words that are so beautiful in Genesis chapter 26 and verse 5. Here's what the Bible says. And why did God bless him? Because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. A lot of people read that and say, wait a minute, that's long, long, long before Sinai. 
You have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You have Jacob's 12 sons, and you have they go into bondage. Then they have they come out, and then the Lord gives them 10 commandments. And people that think the commandments just came into existence at Sinai thought, well, what commandments did Abraham keep? Well, you find in the Bible there were 1,500 years of unwritten record, but there was not 1,500 years of unwritten requirements to be obedient. Why would, you, why would there be a need to be obedient unless there's something to be obedient in harmony with? How could men have sinned all that time lest there's a law that could have been violated? But Abraham was the one that was the man that was obedient. He obeyed my voice. Obedience could not exist except there is a law to live in harmony with. So we find, once again, as we look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, you find, once again, this unconditional extension of a commandment and, the, and a covenant from God. But surely he does require obedience on the part of those who embrace it. Hebrews 10 and verse 16 we go on all the way down to the new covenant. And in as we look through the lessons, I'm just so excited. When we prepare for these lessons, as we look through them, we start to see things that we love to say today. <laughs> but we got to wait till the time comes because I just have loved this study. But he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds I will write them. In other words, they're not going to have to carry around the Torah. They're not going to have to carry around the Ark of the Covenant. It is going to be here. It's going to be here. And the consciences of men can only be consciences when the Spirit of God awakens within them this reminder that there's an obligation. God made a covenant with you. And your obligation to honor that covenant, if that covenant is violated, it awakens within us this sense of guilt, this sense of falling short, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We can't fall short unless there's a covenant to live up, to, to exalt and to measure our lives by, a standard by which each one of us is going to be judged. Now, the, according to the lesson so far, we have seen that the covenant is always a covenant of grace, but it's never a covenant that does not require obedience. So Suffice it to say this, let's look at a couple of passages looking at the obedience aspect of it. And I'm going to come at, come at it from the New Testament perspective because we know we find all throughout the Old Testament this cadence of the children of Israel, the cadence of the Hebrews going in, the Israelites coming out, of uh, Eden, of Noah, of Moses. We find these covenants continually made. But the covenant language continues in the New Testament. Luke 6 and verse 46. Look at what the Lord says. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? <laughs> so the covenant is there too, because for anyone who calls the Lord his Lord or her Lord, we must do what the Lord says. Remember the Israelites when they were given the commandments, all that the Lord has said we will do. The same thing applies here in the New Testament. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Another one that people love to ignore, John 14, 15, if you love me, <laughs> keep my commandments. That's simply when the Lord is your God. You can't say he is my Lord, but I'm not going to keep his commandments. Then you will be guilty as, as Isaiah 24, verse 5 says, they, they broke my laws, they violated my commandments. Or they broke my Commandments, they violated my laws. You can't call God, and I'm going to specifically speak to Christians, you can't call Jesus Lord and then ignore, ignore his commandments. 1 John 2, verse 3 and 4, or verse 4, 1 John 2, verse 4, he who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. That's that covenant obligation. And then the, and then the apostles, as they went forth proclaiming the gospel, once again, the show of obedience to that co covenant. Acts 5 and verse 32, and we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. The covenant is not without obedience. Look at these five points. God promised Noah that his family would be spared, but it was on the condition of Noah's obedience to God's covenant. Hebrews 11 and verse 7. By faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. And as Shelley said, there is no other righteousness but righteousness by faith. 
Number two, when God gave Moses the principles of the law, Israel responded with affirmation that God's law warranted a response. And in short, all that the Lord has said we will do, Exodus chapter 24, verse 7 and 8. All that the Lord had said we will do. <laughs> Did they do it? You can't do anything by declaration. You have to rely on the Spirit of God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Number three, the covenant of God does not dismiss our obligation to God's commandments. Psalm 78 and verse 10, they did not keep the covenant of God. Why? They refused to walk in his law. Let me ask a question. Are you a New Testament Christian that believes you don't have to walk in God's law? Well, the same statement applies to you. There's no way that you could be a covenant-keeping Christian, a covenant-keeping worshiper of God and not be obedient to the law of God. Number four, God requires obedience to his covenant. Jeremiah 11, verse 1 to 6. I don't have time to read all of it, but I'll just simply put it this way. He says, Obey my voice and do according to all that I command you, and you shall be my people. And lastly, um, we find that God's covenant is always something that comes out of an obligation from our hearts. Let me make this point as we transition. If your heart is not filled with love for the Lord, the covenant of God is his love to you. Your response to the covenant of God is your love to him. Do you love him that much? Mm. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Man, that's, this is a rich lesson. This was a rich lesson indeed. So let's take uh, some time just to go back through and give some final thoughts. Monday's lesson, we talked about El Shaddai, our God who can do anything and take any seemingly impossible situation and turn it around. Just want to encourage you, no matter what you are going through, no matter what you are experiencing, call on him and he will be faithful That's to right. you. Amen. Well, Abraham's, Abraham's name was changed to Abraham because he chose to be faithful to God. And that means that God wants to transform him as well as us. I, I'm reading to you from Revelation chapter 2, uh, verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. And God wants to give you a new start, a new name, and make you part of his family. Amen. We saw in an, on Thursday or Wednesday that God revealed separate, he revealed his covenant in several stages to Abraham. The progressive unfolding of that in Exodus 2 24, when he, God hears the Hebrews, he remembers his covenant with Abraham. The Sinai covenant is built on this everlasting covenant with Abraham. In Luke uh, 1 and verse 72, God sends Christ. He remembers his covenant with Abraham. It's all about the everlasting covenant. That's right. If you are a covenant-keeping Christian, God does not want lip service. He wants life service. Amen. Amen. Matthew 15, verse 8, the people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. I pray that you will not be a lip service Christian, but a life service Christian. Mm. Yeah. Praise the Lord. This, this lesson has reminded me of just how committed God really is to us. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not always the case that we are as committed to Him, but uh, He is certainly committed to us. And I just want to invite you, if you're home uh, watching, wherever you are around the world, commit yourself to Christ. Just at, reach out to Him and ask Him, Lord, Help me to be more committed to you, and he will give you the spirit to do so. We want to invite you to come back next week and join us for another lesson entitled Children of the Promise. Until then, thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you right back here next week on 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. <laughs>